So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Thomas Kuhn. I'm from Frankfurt, Germany, and that is actually very close to the Oculus, Oculus company in Wetzlar, Germany, closer than most of you are. <laughs> so we have the AXL Wave talk today, studies and clinical um, uh, cases and financial disclosures I consult for Oculus. Uh, in Germany, we helped the company in a lot of these developments together over the years. And maybe I start with this, the change in expectation for more precise measurements are necessary. We have patients, you know, years ago, cataract surgery, you remove the lens, get glasses. I, this is history because we have the expectation from our patients are getting higher and higher. We are working in premium IOLs all the time. And if you don't respect the cornea, in other words, if you don't look at the various measurements, then you cannot be precise in your procedures. And that's very, you know, that's very useful. I use this device basically in every patient, in every patient. Your development, Pentacam 2002 at this academy, Jesus Christ, 19 years ago, 2007, uh, the HR, AXL with the actual length measurements in 2015 and then 2019 the AXL wave. So that's a two year uh, term now. Okay, so th these are the devices we, which have used. We start with the Pentacam AXL, then, then the HR and then the AXL. Um, if you look at aberrations, um, just for, I mean, you all know this, uh, but, but there are three types of aberrations, content, lower and higher order. And in order to look at the constant aberrations, uh, they are exist in all optical um, systems, and the lower order are encountered with spherical cylindrical refractive errors. Higher order aberrations are found in irregular systems, more or less. So, just for you know, very shortly to start, this is the lower and higher order aberration pyramid, the Zernike polynomials, and I like to explain it very quickly because some people look at it and they never understand it really. So it's the low, low order aberrations, the high order aberrations. And in the low, you see at Z1, you have tilt, with other words, a system which tilts in the optical system. You have astigmatism on the right and the left side of the pyramid and three. And then you have defocus, with other words, minus or plus in your refraction. And if you look at the high order aberrations, two major components is vertical coma in the middle and then Z4 four is spherical aberration. And spherical aberration, very important. It, we use this in wavefront optimized treatments all the time now. I researched over the last 20 years higher order aberrations, and we started wavefront guided treatments and then moved to wavefront optimized treatments. And we learned so much from the wavefront taken treatments to the optimization, but basically it's um, primary spherical aberration, which we have you know, incorporated in the, in the laser profiles. The new, your device, the new Pentacam AXL, they has actually Scheinfug tomography and optical biometry, which the AXL already had. But then you have new features. These are the three, wavefront aberration, objective refraction, and read to elimination. Uh, it's a hartmann shack sensor included. And I talk a little bit why we benefit in our clinic, and I think it's useful for people to look at this. So when I have uh, the workup of my patients, um, I have, of course, a big team. And what I do now more and more, I basically ask them to take a wave and an AXL wave because I have five information settings in this device. And it's only taken by one person and this one person does it in one shot, and I have the objective refraction, total uh, eye, um, uh, wavefront, retro elimination, optical biometry, and tear segment tomography. Uh, it's pretty easy. It takes a little longer time, but I think it's easy, and they do it at one point, and then it's comfortable for the patient because you only have to go into one device. That's it. You bring into one device, you have all the information. And because it's network, network compatible, we can use it in our workstations in the future research. Further on this, objective refraction for every patient, I think that, that changes in the future. We just did a study, I come to this, and if we can have with this device objective refraction, we can basically, maybe we still have to do it, but we can spare the optician. 
because we don't have to do it anymore because we already get it. Wavefront aberrations, as I said, are important for our refractive procedures, also for the um, uh, intraocular lens procedures. Assessment of reason for visual disturbance is very important. We would like to exclude, for example, early keratoconus. And we also have these pupil measurements, which I found interesting. <clears throat> we are short on pupil measurements. And now we have this device, which gives us two uh, measurements, mesopic and scatopic, and, and also have the optical biometry and IOL calculator. So this is a bunch of things which I have done in one device. And therefore, you know, this entire segment tomography is really good. And we also use it for the screening of Ectasia, as I pointed out. You all know this, this is a fast screening report. If you go through this, you have glaucoma screening. You look at the anterior chamber uh, depths, you look at the screening device, you look at thickness of the cornea for any corneal device, endothelium dystrophy, because if they're thicker, you already know there is something going on. You have the bill in Ambrosia for the uh, ectasia screening. You have corneal refractive power, which is important for my IOLs. And then the opacification of the lens surgery or the lens per se is also very important because I think we're moving maybe in that direction that payers, that insurance companies will ask, is this a cataract or is it refractive lens exchange? Because at least in Germany, that's totally different. Refractive lens exchange is not paid by the insurance company. Cataract is. So, you know, you need to understand that. For the screening routine and refractive surgery, we use it preoperative fast screening report, Bell and Ambrosio with four maps and post-optively with a comparison to four maps in one. Again here, the screening, a refractive surgery, as I pointed out already, uh, this is a very important map. I teach this all my residents. You take a look at this, at this modality for refractive surgery, and you have then the axial uh, map in the left part upstairs. So you know the, 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 the corneal um, index, not but, but basically the refractive uh, component 42, um, 40, uh, 45 um, uh, curvature here. Then you have the elevation on the anterior and the posterior, and you also have the corneal thickness, in this case, 512 normal cornea. Bale and Ambrosio, very important for us. Um, if you do the screening, you, you look at the, the numbers, you have the comparison to a normal cornea, to the thickness, to the epithelium, and that also helps us determine in refractive surgery patients with early keratoconus. In cataract surgery, we also do this pre-op cataract screening, fast screening, cataract pre, Bale and Ambrosio formats refractive. Again, this fast screening helps more and more. And then the pre-cataract uh, is also looking at it. And I found this to be very important because this shows me the uh, axial, the total corneal power, the corneal thickness, as well as the, um, uh, um, the, the, the measurements in the cornea in terms of posterior and anterior measurements. Again, pre-cataract, not so important because we don't look at the refractive surgery, but the pre-cataract screening can look the same like this. And in keratoconus, I think I already pointed out this out, keratoconus here, red marks, very clear, patient has keratoconus. You can see this, I think, already in the tomography, so it's a no-brainer. Here's a keratoconus, and then again on this screening. So this is important for my procedures for cross-linking, for uh, ruling out patients for refractive surgery. These patients very often come with the question, can I have refractive surgery, Professor Conan, on the uh, myopic eye? I'm three diopters and I want that. And then you see keratoconus, so you don't can do it. HR, we did studies on the repeatability of lens densiometry. I, I go quickly through the studies. We had 105 eyes and we looked at the repeatability and we found that lens densiometry was highly repeatable. Repeatability depended on the analyzed modus. You have three modi, modi and then the repeatability decreased with increasing opacification. With other words, the higher the cataract, the less repeatability we were, we were showing. But I think that's not the, that's not the sense. We, what we want is we want to figure out if this patient has opacification or not, as I pointed out. LASIK exclusion, same thing, post-myopic LASIK. You can see this here very nicely done uh, in this device here. Central flattening, thickness of the cornea is less because patients had been treated, tissue had been removed. And also here the 
uh, post-myopic LASIK, very important. Some people don't talk about it. A patient, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years after LASIK, comes in the clinic, wants refractive lens exchange because he cannot see near. He can see very well at distance. He cannot see near. And if you oversee that this patient and you have asked him, have you had any surgery? They say no. They cannot remember. Sometimes they just don't, they forget. Two months later, two years later, that's fine. But 20 years later, they, they forget. And then you look at this and you say, Mr. Miller, can you remember you had a procedure? Because it's important for our measurement, you know? And then I think also this uh, corneal opacification uh, is important. We use it in the clinic more and more to figure out. Sometimes you can really see that patients had a treatment which you cannot see on a normal map. So also very important. I love this. This display, I will overview with this 12 items. I really love it because you have the pupil size here uh, under scotopic conditions, 8.1 forces so the large pupil. You have a pupil in under mesopic, 4.8. You have the richer illumination. You have this, this tool which shows me that the optical system is nice. You have here the refraction and the higher order aberration, refraction here. So I immediately see this patient as 0 0.3, so low myope. I have the axial length, also with a standard deviation. I have the total refractive power, and I have here the, the measurement on the corneal curvature, 42, 41, uh, 42.8, 43.1, thickness, and tear chamber depths. That's all fantastic. So. Post-surgery, why do we benefit from this? We do objective refractance for every patient. So I'm, if this works, and I show you the studies, then it's much easier for every refractive surgeon because he basically takes one measurement, he has a refraction, he doesn't have to send it to the optician. That's fantastic. High order aberrations is important, reach elimination, wavefront measurements, as I again said, and assessment of visual performance. And that you can see this here is a simulation, and that's good because you have it on the cornea, you have the internal and you have the total one. Again here, a case uh, with pre-surgery. So let me do, go through a couple of cases. Post-surgery, uh, patient had four diopters. Post-surgery, one diopter of myopia. Uh, Post-surgery, still some blurry, so something is going on. And here I go with you through a patient which is hyperopic or who is hyperopic, had a subjective refraction of plus four, minus four approximately. So really tricky refraction. Intraocular pressure, 14, 15. We did a trifocal acrylisa with, you see here, with 5.5 diopters of astigmatic component um, in this patient. And then the post uh, map, four color maps showed still, of course, the corneal astigmatism, the thickness in both eyes. Pre-op, this was done the same. And then post-op, just very quickly, we, 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 we compared the axis and the patients, you see in the right eye is not happy because it's 0 0.4, uncorrected, best corrected visual acuity is better. But you see he has a residual astigmatism of two diopters in that patient. In the left eye, it was perfect, 20-20. And if we looked at the axis, we found in the right eye an axis deviation of eight degrees. And that's important. If you have a patient who has you know, almost like five diopters on the cornea, if the lens, the intraocular lens doesn't sit correctly on the axis, then you have a problem. And you see it here. He had remained 2.5 and see, he also had a plus component. So that means the IOL was correct. It was not too low or too high, but the cylinder was still there. So then we did, of course, remeasurement patient was not fat satisfied. Here in your ritual emanation, we found the axis very easily. And then we did the uh, measurement, we do the Badal, which is the vector analysis. And Badal told us you have to rotate the lens in this direction, this degree. We did this, we did the rotation, and now we're ending up four months later, plus 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 0 0.8, not as perfect as in the left eye, but very close and now the patient is set, satisfied uh, with the outcome. So the benefit is really if you have that ritual relation, you already have done it in the pre, you can see easily and very quickly if you compare it just to what you 
intended to put the lens in, so the resident can do it, it says, Professor Cohn put it at zero degrees, and now it's at 10 degrees, and he had done it with the way, a wave, AXL wave, he has taken the measurement, he can say directly, immediately, this lens is not sitting on the right axis, he does his uh, measurement uh, with vector analysis and gets it out. So, I love it. Patient number two, um, basically higher order aberrations, patient's not happy. Um, we looked at the retroillumination, you see clearly that's a, a posterior op opacification, so a secondary cataract. So I did YAG laser and the patient was happy. I mean, you can also see it as a slit limb, but because you have that in the preoperative screening, so the patients come to the clinic, the first thing is we do the AXL and you have everything on this 12 you can already see, oh, right, the visual axis is not clear. There must be a, a posterior cataract. The, uh, the IOL is not sitting correctly, so that's all there. So very quickly, on this um, consecutive series of fakic and fakic, we looked at wavefront measurements with your device versus eye trace. And we found uh, that the 11 patients, three consecutive measurements, Pentacam versus eye trace, the mean spherical equivalent wave was 1.56 and I Tracy and Tracy 2.8. Coefficient of variant was a little bit better with the wave than with the eye trace. We found Pentacam AXL wave tends to measure hyperopic eyes more myopic than the eye trace, and the Pentacam AXL wave tends to measure myopic eyes more hyperopic than the eye trace. So a little bit, you know, still scared, low number of patients. Pentacam shows a higher accordance to the subjective refraction performed by a trained optician, and the eye trace show good accordance, but less compared to the Pentacam AXL wave. And the results also, the best coefficient of variance was found with the uh, Pentacam overall in the smaller series. Conclusion, both devices give good accordance of objective refraction, uh, but the Pentacam had a higher consensus with our patients both devices of a good coefficient of variation. So that was important to, to benchmark it to another wavefront measurement because this is a wavefront measurement, one device. You have several measurements in one device. So another study also retrospective, 20 eyes, we looked at the AXL wave, uh, looked at coefficient of repeatability very quickly and the Pentacam wave provides a higher repeatability of total RMS and third and fourth order higher order aberration and the coefficient repeatability was below, uh, as you see, for pupil diameters up to four and uh, five millimeters, very good. These results are very pr promising and for our patient uh, will be studies. And this is a newer study, 100 eyes measurement, AXL wave, eye trace aberration. Um, and we again looked at this. Uh, here are the outcome. Let me, don't bother you with the numbers. To, so in conclusion, Aberometry with the Pentacam was very good, better repeatability than with the eye trace and good overall agreement. And the hybrid tomographer, topographer, aberometer could replace existing separate devices we found in, in our study. Another, I think, a final example, a patient 68 years with a cataract, hyperopic, and the theorial uh, density was okay. He wants to be spectacle independent. I do my pre-op map. I do uh, the measurements, as you can see here. What we really usually interested is the, uh, the, the posterior corneal surface. So you see here in this eye, he has one diopter on the anterior, one diopter at the total refractive corneal astigmatism. And then here you have 1.4 and 1.3. So they compare, that was good, and we, used according to this we also looked with the IOL master the total corner refractive power of 1.0 and 1.3 we did our IOL calculation uh, this is actually a patient with a, a panoptics so a trifocal lens and look the beautiful result 2020 everywhere or 2025 perfect for distance intermediate and near patient is happy refractive outcome almost amotropic so very good. Now in IOL power calculation, I think that's also useful with the machine. You can, there are a couple of devices like Savini's uh, uh, calculation formula. And uh, here we choose an 11.5 diopter lens. That's a printout. 
iris image and keratometry overlay for toric version you have there again the printout for your iol and so also this device can be really used for the iol calculation so it's really a machine which starts to be our gold standard pentacam development has always been there for 20 years uh, a arch then the axl and then the axl wave um, refractive screening is very important, cataract screening, very important, keratoconus screening, very important, and IOL power calculation. So that is a device which can really be used for clinicians in a very good manner. And our studies have shown, you know, also good outcomes with the refractor, refraction. And we're currently working now on a very in interesting topic. We do four studies where we evaluate actually the AXL when we have different lenses in the eye, with other words, a monofocal lens, a toric lens, an EDOF lens, and a trifocal lens. And we would like to figure out, can this device take the refraction? Because that's, that's, a, that's a hindrance. If a patient comes after surgery to a local physician, he has to refract them. And we can figure out without refraction, if this patient is amotropic or not, then you immediately know the patient is happy or not. So that's a, a ongoing uh, research we're doing. I thank you for your attention. Of course, if you have a question, welcome to take them. Thank you.